Welcome to the second of this year's Humanitas Women's Rights Lectures by Natasha Walter. I'm Sarah Franklin and I chair the committee that organizes these events. And every year I feel a great sense of relief that this occasion exists. The occasion to think about feminism um, and to think about feminist politics with the leading public intellectual and women's rights activists here at Cambridge. For this is an increasingly important task, not only because feminism is enjoying something of a resurgence of late, but also because it isn't. There are many places, including many within this university, where women seem to be not only absent, but not to exist at all. And I don't only mean on the walls of all the college dining rooms or on the course syllabi that don't feature any women authors. I mean, I mean in meetings where women are actually present, but are ignored and sidelined. And dinners where any woman seated at the table is assumed to be another diner's wife. And obviously that's not gonna happen at any of our dinners, but. Um, I did, when I first came to Cambridge, begin to keep a diary <laughs> in which I had to write down some of the things that happened because I couldn't quite believe it had. Um, this list goes on. As the former chair of the Humanitas Women's Rights Lecture Committee, Professor Henrietta Moore once said to me, there's only one adjective to describe the levels of sexism at Cambridge, and that is breathtaking. These lectures are a part of the effort to challenge the sexist status quo at Cambridge and elsewhere. And with us tonight is one of the UK's leading feminist authors and activists, whose work has informed and inspired many to act up and to speak out. The New Feminism, published by Virago in 1998, and Living Dolls, published a decade later, reject the premise of a post-feminist generation by arguing both that sexism is alive and well, and that new feminist voices are joining older ones in the effort to speed up its elimination. In her first lecture, Natasha urged us to celebrate the recent surge in feminist confidence and candor. She also detailed the new twist in how sexism has come to operate through a language of choice, a language that feminism itself rightly championed, but which has since been turned back on itself in a mockery of earlier political ambitions. In her first lecture, From Sexism to Solidarity, Natasha also argued in favor of what she called, or nearly called, and, and should call, share platforming, in order to challenge the languages of shame and retribution that are used to silence objections to sexual violence, sexual trafficking, and everyday sexual harassment. Natasha also spoke about the charity she founded, Women for Refugee Women, which is recently featured on um, Channel 4 News in the context of the Jarls Wood investigation that revealed the brutal treatment of so-called failed asylum seekers currently detained by the Home Office. Tonight, Natasha will challenge us to move from reform to revolution. Please join me in welcoming our very distinguished lecturer tonight. Sarah, thank you again for that more than generous introduction. I have to say it's great to be back here again. Um, after Tuesday's talk, I was so intrigued and interested by the discussion and some of the themes that people brought up that any of you who were there then might notice that I'm bringing some of the insights of the audience into what I'm going to say tonight. And yesterday, um, I also did a workshop, a really energetic and interesting workshop with the Cambridge Feminist Society together with two women I work with at Women for Refugee Women. 
Rahab Jamiel and Garda al Nasseri. And I think some of the insights from that are also worming their way into this talk. What we do as feminists, I think we're always standing on the shoulders of giants, as I said on Tuesday, the great feminists that came before us. But also I am very aware of the many voices that are coming in and shaping this talk tonight. Any errors, obviously, are my own. The experience of being here in Cambridge this week, being able to discuss some of the ideas that have, I've been thinking about for some time with people who seem to be on similar journeys is immensely valuable to me. So I do want to thank again those at the Humanitas Programme and the Centre for Research into Arts, Social Sciences and Humanities for this invitation to me to speak here. I hope, I know that this is a discussion that will extend beyond this week. So I ended my talk on Tuesday with an exploration of solidarity, and it's there that I want to begin this second talk. Because as I said then, I recognise that this may seem quite an odd time to be talking about solidarity, given the splintering of so much feminism into personal anger, with so much calling out of individuals for their perceived failings. Um, and at a time, I think, when we're all more and more aware, rightly so, of issues that divide us from our ethnic background to our class, our gender identity, our sexuality. So I am well aware that it may be risky to talk about solidarity at this time. But I very much believe that this is a risk we have to take if feminism is to move forward and to build towards change. And change is what we need, how can we doubt this? When, as Sarah so rightly said, we are seeing both the resurgence of feminism and its opposite. When those basic issues around equal pay and equal political, equal political representation still elude us even in the West, when we're still surrounded by cultural sexism, when we're becoming more and more aware of the struggles that women have throughout the globe. So I spoke on Tuesday about, above all, about three kinds of solidarity. That very basic solidarity, which you could just call courtesy, which I think is about putting more of our energy into supporting the writers and speakers that we admire, rather than always looking for the phrase and the argument and the picture that we hate, because I believe this is a big struggle that we have ahead of us, and we need to be big enough to take it on. <coughs> I talked also about the pragmatic solidarity that leads us to make alliances with people even if we don't share all their ideas and their backgrounds. We do that because we want to seek political change. And when I think about that, there are certain images, memories that, that rise in my head that happened recently. Um, like Nimco Ali, one of the leaders of the movement against FGM, handing an anti-FGM keyring to the Duchess of Cornwall or Rahela Siddiqui, a refugee I work with from Afghanistan, discussing the needs of women in conflict with William Hague at a recent summit. These political alliances that really cross borders and backgrounds, I think are vital if we're to build support. It's very important that we don't mistake purity for power. But I also talked about emotional solidarity. Because I think, well, that kind of courteous solidarity might underpin our everyday discussions and pragmatic solidarity might underpin our political work. Isn't all of this feminist work we do underpinned by that moment when you discover your own empathy with other women? Even if you don't share her experiences, you don't want to speak for her, you don't want to erase the differences, but you do recognise that shared humanity that crosses borders. And I'm constantly reminded of this with the women I work with at Women for Refugee Women. At that ch little charity in London, about 60 women come to our offices each week. They've crossed borders from all over the world. And I know we have so many differences of education and background and life experience. I know these women may face double, triple disadvantage as women, as women of colour, as survivors of violence, as asylum seekers. I can't speak for them. I can't pretend to know what their experiences of oppression are. But we can't let the differences, which I think at times loom so large, divide us. And these women are my colleagues and leaders and mentors, even though others may want to situate them as our clients or case studies. For instance, I want to talk about one of my most inspirational colleagues, a woman called Maimuna Jawo. Maimuna comes from a village in the Gambia, where she was raised to be a cutter for FGM, female genital mutilation, like her mother and her grandmother before her. But she says that she realized herself 
that what she was what was happening in her village what her family was doing was wrong she realized it despite all the pressures of tradition and of her family and her village she knew as well as any of us well so much better that young girls must be enabled to keep their bodies intact and that what had happened to her was abuse Maymuna and I were born in such different family structures, nationalities, and ethnicities. I don't want to erase any of our differences when I say I want to stand in solidarity with her, a solidarity based on our shared humanity and my admiration for her courage. So forgive me for going back on this idea of solidarity again if you're at my first talk, but I feel that trust and solidarity is essential if we are to create change. And the process of creating change is currently at the forefront of what it is to be a feminist. Because these days, it just doesn't feel enough, does it, to, talk, to only talk about the problems of sexism and inequality, to worry about the problems. It feels essential to be taking action. I began to feel this urgency was shared widely when my last book, Living Dolls, was published five years ago. That book, which is primarily about sexism and everyday culture, about the hypersexuality around young women. I thought when it was published that readers and critics would ask me, why do you think this? Or how do you know this? But instead, when I was speaking about the book at festivals, universities, conferences, the response was pretty much universal and it was very different. It was, how do we change this? Well, how do we create change? I think the history of feminism tells us that change is always possible. Over and over again, we can see in the past that women have surmounted what may seem like insurmountable obstacles to create progress. Feminism has already won so many rights for women in the West, from contraception to abortion, suffrage to higher education to entry into the professions. And for some of us in this room, this enabling of certain freedoms and rights may seem like a rather straightforward path but I think if you look more deeply into the history of creating change, even things that may look straightforward now, like the entry of women into this university or getting the vote, you realise that the actual process at the time, it was always a bit of a wager that the result of any action taken was always quite uncertain at the time it was taken, that there were always so many detours along the way, many disappointing enemies, many surprising allies. And my own feeling about getting involved in action that aims for greater equality is it's never easy to see the wood for the trees while you're doing so. But when you stand and look back, you can start to see some patterns that may look hopeful, that may speak to you of opportunity as well as challenge. So in my first lecture, I connected the continued inequality we still experience to other aspects of cultural sexism, because I think these are deeply connected. If women are encouraged to see themselves as primarily valued for their sexualized appearance, it's clearly harder then for them to move into the public realm, harder for them to be valued on other terms, like their, their experience, their talents, their abilities, their competence. Obviously, I recognize that these different levels of sexism may not be all of equal weight. Some may not be nearly as oppressive as others. And sometimes, oddly, I think it's the most trivial aspects of sexism that can feel really hard to combat. Because, you know, if we don't want to create very humorless, kind of politically correct frames for our lives, how are we going to stand up to that cultural sexism? So I remember when I published Living Dolls and people asked, well, what do we do about it? I said, well, I don't have the answer. None of us do. But listen, let, let's not underestimate the power of just of naming this problem, of having a debate and starting a conversation about it. And since the publication of that book, and I'm not in any way trying to claim responsibility for what's happened next, but I do think we have seen this conversation really explode. If we've seen change anywhere, we've seen it in the way people talk about sexism. Looking at that change, I think for a long time we were prevented from seeing the full picture of sexism because we were encouraged to see each instance as a personal failure. You know, something that's isolated, that was just that experience. At the end of Living Dolls, I discussed how important it is that we connect the dots. I wrote then, even if you feel irritated by the sale of toy irons labelled Mummy and Me in a high street shop, 
or if you feel angry by the opening of a lap dancing club in your town centre, you might feel it would be a bit extreme to complain. You might feel that the joke on a late night comedy show is degrading to the female participants, but then again you might wonder if you're overreacting. And even when you hear about an example or experience an example of outrageous sexism for discrimination to violence, you might wonder, is this one isolated incident? I was delighted when Laura Bates contacted me over social media a couple of years ago to tell me about the, this initiative that she was starting up to collect evidence of those isolated incidents, those examples of sexism that stud through our lives. Her Everyday Sexism project has been a massive success, a real breakthrough and exploring the impact of what has so easily been dismissed as trivial, personal, isolated experiences, from threats on the street to banter in the workplace. And I think what we've seen is that through this project, the conversation has shifted so that that girl who hadn't been able to speak up on the bus or that woman who hadn't shouted at her boss found a space for her rage. And this talking back is essential because it makes women the subject rather than the object of this conversation. And many women in the public eye are also pushing forward this shift in the conversation. For instance, when Charlotte Church spoke out about sexism in the music industry, she said that when she was 19, she was pressured into wearing more and more revealing outfits. I felt deeply uncomfortable, she said, about the whole thing. But I was often reminded by record company executives whose money was being spent I was barely out of my teenage years, and the consequence of this portrayal of me is that I am frequently abused on social media. I'm called a slut, a whore, and a catalogue of other indignities. But through speaking out, I think Church changed the direction of this conversation. Similarly, when Emma Watson talked in front of the UN about being sexualised by the media at the age of 14, or when Jennifer Lawrence stated that the people looking at the stolen naked pictures of her were guilty of a sex crime, they too were changing the direction of the conversation about them. They too were deciding it's time to be subject, not object to the discussion. And these shifts in the direction of the conversation, I think, are creating changes in themselves. And it's interesting to me that some of the most successful campaigns at the moment against sexism are situated as conversations with producers or editors or retailers, rather than demand for change from government or proposals for new regulations. So if you look at something like the No More Page 3 campaign, it's interesting, I think, that it addresses itself directly to the editor of The Sun, whereas a previous campaign against Page 3, Claire Short's campaign in the 1980s, looked for policy change and had those debates in Parliament. I think you can see now this idea emerging much more strongly that if you get enough women and men shouting back, pushing the conversation another way, maybe even without regulation and government action, you can create change. So the sun does seem to have dropped page three, even if it won't quite announce that and come out and say that it has because it doesn't want to hand the victory over. And other similar campaigns have had some effect. There have been campaigns like Lose the Lads magazines and following that one supermarket decided to stop stocking lads' magazines. One magazine has closed down. Another has decided to stop putting images of naked women on the covers. As one editor put it after taking that decision no longer to have naked women on the covers, he said, it's the right thing to do in 2014 because attitudes have changed. I think the audience is ready for it, the market's ready for it. We don't want anyone to feel alienated by our covers. Really, we've done this because we have seen there is a demand for change. Another discussion I embarked on in Living Dolls was about the pinkification of young girls' lives, something I've been alerted to by the birth of my own daughter. I myself had grown up at a time, I think, when girls and boys played with much the same toys and wore much the same clothes. But when my own daughter was born 14 years ago, I saw this tide of pink just encroaching on her room almost as soon as she was born. And Living Dolls... It opened with a vis visit to Hamley's toy shop in London and my entry into the girls' toys floor. And I wrote, it was as though as someone had jammed rose-coloured spectacles over my eyes, and yet the effect was nauseating rather than beautifying. My description of the sharp division between girls' and boys' toys and my exploration of how poor science was being used to justify different treatment of girls' and boys' 
fell on fertile ground. And again, I don't want in any way to claim sort of responsibility for um, the changes that have happened since then. But changes have happened. And again, this has been moved through not by a demand for policy change, but through discussions and demands made on producers and retailers. So for instance, in 2012, a campaign called Let Toys Be Toys was launched out of a discussion on Mums Net, which it's a very basic demand, just asking the toy producers and retailers to stop dividing the girls' and the boys' toys into these pink and blue aisles. And it's had real effects. Boots has stopped putting science toys into the boys' toys section, and Marks and Spencer has started to display toys under signs saying toys and books for kids rather than boys and girls. And just a couple of years after Living Dolls was published, Hamleys changed the layout of their store, and the floors are no longer explicitly labelled for girls and for boys. I know that if you look at the bigger picture, these can seem like puny changes, given the scale of what we're facing. But I've opened them up this evening because I do think it's important to look at well, some of the opportunities that are opening up, as well as challenges that are facing us. And I believe that changing a conversation can often create real change. In my first lecture, I also mapped the biggest change I think we've seen recently in feminism, the rise in truth-telling about violence and abuse, <coughs> whether we're talking about celebrities taking advantages of young women in the recent past or men preying on vulnerable young women in care or child sexual exploitation going on right now in cities across the UK. I think people are recognising the extent and impact of sexual abuse in a way that has not been seen before. And this surge in truth-telling, it has already created real change. Men are being prosecuted who had once have walked free. Victims are being heard who were previously silenced. And gangs that got away with their crimes for years are now being stopped. But when we look at what's been happening here, I think it reminds us not to overstate the change that happens when the conversation shifts. It reminds us that we have to embed shifts in awareness in policy change, changes in police behaviour, changes in government resourcing. And this isn't happening yet on the scale that's needed. I, and I'm sure others, are very struck by the investigation that was carried out at the end of last year by the journalist Samira Ahmed in Rotherham. In Rotherham, there's been so much speaking up and discussion about the extent of child sex abuse. But is she notably exposed? Many alleged perpetrators have not yet been arrested or investigated, and there's still no organised support for victims and families. She noted that the Rotherham's Women's Counselling Service is still struggling with lack of resources and has a six-month waiting list. And this isn't just in Rotherham. A recent parliamentary report on funding for support for victims of sexual and, abuse, sexual and domestic abuse found the same picture across the UK. It said that the current funding model just isn't fit for purpose because so many services are drawing on reserve funding just to survive. Some have already been forced to close and more will be lost over the coming years. And that shows that despite the shift in conversation about sexual abuse, there is a crying need to embed that shift in actual changes on the ground, investigation of perpetrators, education of boys and men, and simply in these basic support needed for victims. I think there's a danger that, that once we've had a conversation, we often forget about that long, hard work that needs to be done for investment in services or real policy change. And despite all this rise in feminist debate and activism, I'm very aware at the moment of how hard it is to get even a small, small policy change through because of this campaign that I'm currently working on around Yarlswood and the detention of women who seek asylum. And I very much want to take a bit of time to talk to you about this campaign. It's so important to me. It's where I've been focusing so much of my energy over the last couple of years. But I also think it shows where some of our strengths and challenges as feminists lie right now. This is, this is an urgent issue for feminism for all of us. The UK government at the moment, for all its talk on combating sexual violence and working for women's rights, is locking up about 2,000 women who come to this country seeking protection. 
These are women who come here as asylum seekers, crossing borders for their safety. The majority that, that we speak to who are detained after seeking asylum say that they've already experienced torture or sexual violence in their home countries. Given their existing trauma, they find detention extremely distressing in and of itself. Remember, this is indefinite detention. These are the only people that can be locked up without a set tariff, without a set time limit. They don't know how long they will be locked up. We talk to women who are locked up for weeks, months, even a year. And abuse and harassment is rife in detention. We have documented over the last year how women are routinely watched in Yarlswood in intimate situations by men, including when they're in bed or on the toilet. Many of the women we speak to say they're self-harming in detention. Well, in our recent piece of research, more than half the women we spoke to were on suicide watch. But this policy on detention is completely unnecessary, as well as being so inhumane. It doesn't even help with immigration controls. Although the government says it's necessary to hold people prior to deportation, in fact, women are held arbitrarily at any point in the asylum process. And most of them leave detention not to be deported, but to re-enter our community, their detention having served no purpose at all. Why is this happening? Why are we doing this to such vulnerable women? And I think there are links to what we've seen with why child sexual exploitation went unchallenged for so long, in that in some way, these women are not seen as the right victims. Just as the girls who are being abused in Rotherham or Oxford were often poor, chaotic, in care, and so people weren't, weren't really interested in them. Their abuse seemed, seemed almost weightless, it seemed, to those who should have been helping them. So too, I think there's a similar problem with the women that we work with, as migrants, as refugees. They don't seem to have the right status as victims. For all the growth of feminist activism, women who cross borders are never really heard in the same way as women who already have a place in our society. It's almost as though their lack of citizenship makes them inaudible. In all our discussion of women's rights, too often these are only rights for women who already have a foothold in our society, not the marginalised, not the stateless. <coughs> for instance, one woman, one woman we recently met in Yarlswood came here to the UK from the Congo. She had been taken by Congolese police from her own home and brought to a prison where she'd been repeatedly raped. She was sprung from prison by her pastor who took her across the border to Uganda and then she paid an agent to take her to London. But here the authorities disbelieved her story about how she'd come to the UK and they locked her up in Yarlswood Detention Centre. When we met her there, she was in such terrible distress. Being watched by men in the detention centre was making her, understandably, relive her experiences in the Democratic Republic of the Congo. She was locked up for six weeks for no purpose, then released back into the community. Somehow her experience seemed unimportant because she wasn't the right kind of rape survivor. Even though our government was at that time speaking up for the need to protect women who experienced sexual violence in conflict, it was as though they couldn't hear her. Indeed, while she was in Yarlswood, she actually saw a news programme with William Hague and Angelina Jolie visiting her area of the Congo and talking about how to protect and support women who'd experienced rape in conflict. But it was as though they couldn't hear her calling to them from a detention centre in the UK. At the heart of our campaign at Women for Refugee Women is just telling these women's stories, just creating spaces where they can be heard. Because we believe that if we build that emotional solidarity that I talked about, if people begin to empathise and recognise the humanity of women who are locked up, then it will be something that they want to take action on. And I think we see this happening. I think we're not mistaken. When these stories are told, people do recognise that shared humanity, and they are so often moved into action. So over the last year, just to pick out a couple of things that have been very energising for the campaign, we took the writer Zadie Smith to Yarlswood, and she released a, a really strong, courageous statement about what she'd seen, or the actress Romola Garay, who also visited and has made a film statement about her visit and what she saw and her sense of empathy. Um, and many other people from many different backgrounds have spoken out. 
um, from the novelist and columnist Alison Pearson to the children's writer Michael Morpurgo, the actress Juliet Stevenson. These are people who have felt that call of emotional solidarity and wanted to join the campaign. But we're surprised by how often the women's testimony alone is not enough. I don't know if you remember when the Jimmy Savile story first began to break. Apparently there was a piece that was ready to go into BBC Newsnight, um, but the editor said to the journalists who were working on the story about it, no, it's just the women, and he refused to run the story. And we faced exactly the same issue with the women in Yarlswood. When we brought forward our latest evidence of abuse and harassment in the detention centre, we worked with an excellent female reporter at BBC Today programme, and she looked at our evidence in which 33 out of the 38 women that we'd spoken to talked about um, men watching them in intimate situations in Yarlswood, about this intrusion and harassment they'd experienced. And she herself interviewed three detainees. That story was ready to run, and at the last minute, her editor pulled the piece. Why? Because it was too small a sample, because the stories were uncorroborated, because Serco denied it. In other words, it was just the women. Still too often, just the women is not enough. When will just the women be enough? When will we allow the voices of all victims, even the poor, the chaotic, or the migrant, to have real weight? This week, luckily, we've seen cameras going into Yarlswood on a brilliant report on Channel 4 News. So we have the corroboration that it isn't just the women. And that, brilliantly, is stimulating more debate in Parliament and in the media. That's important. We hope it will lead to real policy change. Because in our campaign, we are looking for specific policy change. We are looking for reform. We want to end detention of women who seek asylum. We start from that position of emotional solidarity, but we build pragmatic solidarity. We build political alliances, we work with government and other political parties. In trying to build those political alliances, we feel we very much learned from other women's organisations and campaigns. I want to pay tribute to campaigns like the End Violence Against Women Coalition or the Campaign to End FGM. We've watched their deliberate building of support across parties, across the political spectrum. And I think it's actually a characteristic of this wave of feminism that we are ready to seize on and use traditional polit political routes to change. Because after all, how else are we going to get, say, more resources into refuges or prosecutions for FGM or the closure of a detention centre if we're not talking to those who can raise money and change policy now? So policy change... Concrete reform is what we work for, and nothing I go on to say now should detract from that. But what I also want to ask tonight is, can we also, alongside that, <coughs> hold on to a vision or a dream that outruns that kind of pragmatism? After all, there is a strong current of feminism now, which is working for step-by-step -step reform, but is not arguing for any kind of major reorganisation of society or the economy. This kind of individualist, reformist feminism is very powerful right now. It's often associated with international agencies, it's often led by the United States, it's often identified with neoliberal economic policies. For instance, um, when Nicholas Kristof and Cheryl Woodin, the authors of the book Half the Sky, so that's a journalist at the New York Times and a senior banker, when they campaign for women's rights. They see the solution primarily as enabling individual women in the developing world to find paid work opportunities in the globalized economy with help from rich Western donors who may invest in individual women or in charities or in businesses. Or when Sheryl Sandberg, COO of Facebook, campaigns for women's rights, she, what's she doing? She's primarily encouraging women to find ways up the ladder of corporate power. What sticks in my mind from her book, one of her examples of, of um, female solidarity that she thinks we should all imitate, is four female executives at Merrill Lynch who started having lunch together once a month and after lunch would tout each other's achievements in the office. And she said this absolutely worked. Each one of those women rose up the ranks to reach managing director and executive officer levels. And you know, I think good for those women. Though that kind of individualist feminine can feel 
pretty inspirational, and it's good to be reminded of the ability of individual women to succeed. But it, it's also very unthreatening, isn't it? Because that kind of feminism has accepted, completely accepted the structure of the establishment. It believes feminism must work within those structures at all times. But is this all that feminists are dreaming of now? More representation for women within existing structures of power. More opportunities for women within existing economic structures. Incremental changes to just bring a few more perpetrators to justice or a bit more support for victims without changing the existing social frameworks. Yes, I know that can still be vital and for any individual who might be enabled to achieve her ambitions or find safety in this way, such feminism can be transformative. I know that reform of any sort is a massive challenge for us. We know that any of us working in campaigns or frontline services, that still feels elusive. There is still enormous inertia holding us back as well as real misogyny throughout our society. But still, even if my energy and your energy and the energy of the campaigns today is only going to end in minor reforms, I strongly believe that the force of feminism does not just stop with reform that there is a bigger picture that many of us are still working towards, which is not just reformist and never purely individualist. And I think that this is why feminism is still so feared. Because if we follow feminism through to its logical philosophical conclusion, we see it surely must transform society more radically. Feminism begins from that idea that women's lives and women's voices are as important as men's lives and men's voices. That is a radical viewpoint from which feminists down the ages have spoken words that shook the world. When Mary Wollstonecraft said that virtue can only flourish among equals, when Audre Lorde said that every woman must be free to define her own desires rather than having them defined for her. They were imagining a world in which women would be valued for our abilities, experience and humanity rather than an adjunct to men's, or rather than falling into the patterns that had already been created by men. And this really is at the heart of feminism, the idea that women's experiences and women's voices and women's desires are just as valuable as men's experiences and voices. And if we accept that, we surely realize that this cannot be just one kind of woman. We cannot say, I have the same value as a man, but she does not. Or we in this room have the same value as the men in this university, but women beyond these walls do not. The feminism in the West that appeals most to the elites wants to put in place schemes to bring women up those existing ladders to greater wealth and empowerment. But we live in a world that is run at the moment on deep and currently apparently intractable inequality. As many have analysed recently, equality seems to be growing as the rate of capital return outstrips economic growth and wealth seems to be becoming more and more concentrated in the hands of the few. What people often forget in discussions about this growing inequality is that this hurts women more than it hurts men, since women make up the majority of the low paid and a tiny minority of that capital rich elite. Remember that in the US and the UK, two thirds of minimum wage workers are women. Globally, women are fewer than one in 10 of the world's billionaires. So surely our feminist vision is not one which only enables a few more women to break into that small elite, but in which millions of women are still condemned to lives of extreme unbroken poverty. As many feminists have long argued, if we want real, equality and liberation. We have to see more than a helping hand for some women through the existing unequal structures. As feminists then, I think we have to be discussing how can we restructure our economies, our societies, so that we are not relying on millions of women sacrificing their freedoms and their opportunities so that others can realise them. And if we need to challenge barriers of class and poverty, we also need to continue to challenge barriers of nationality and ethnicity. If we are really feminists, we cannot only be concerned about the rights of a few women, 
just the women in this room, in this university, the women like us. We do need to consider the rights of the others, the migrants, stateless, trafficked women, girls in refugee camps. I know it's easy to feel rather overwhelmed by that enormous global vision of what remains to be done. So I want to now return to what that may mean for us concretely. Hannah Arendt said this about the journey of becoming politically active. Humanity is never acquired in solitude and never by giving one's work to the public. It can be achieved only by one who has thrown her life and her person into the venture into the public realm. That venture into the public realm seems clear to me. One exposes oneself to the light of the public as a person. Speaking is a form of action. That is one venture. The other is we start something. We weave our strand into a network of relations. What comes of it, we never know. We've all been taught to say, Lord, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And that is true of all action, quite simply and concretely true, because one cannot know. That is what is meant by a venture. And I would say this venture is only possible when there is trust in people, a trust which is difficult to formulate, but fundamental in what is human in all people. Otherwise, such a venture could not be made. I very much recognise this, this characterisation of the venture into the public realm. I think it's true to say of being active, that what comes of it we'll, we'll never really know, that we have to base it on trust, on alliances with other organisations and individuals who seem to be working for similar goals. Yeah, that pragmatic solidarity yet again. And to try, even in small, limited ways, to embed the values we believe in in our campaigns and our projects. The feminist action I personally often find most inspiring is often not just about making demands and drawing up plans, but actually creating something, a supportive space or a new performance or a social enterprise that might suggest to us that a different world is possible. So perhaps this is another kind of solidarity. We might call it creative solidarity. I think other feminists have called it transformational solidarity where you start off a journey with other women and you, you don't really know where it's going, but it's this journey founded on the values you care about, conversation, creativity, cooperation. This can go alongside, I think, the more pragmatic solidarity and maybe help us to find other ways, a different way of working. So just to take a small example, I've personally been very inspired over the last few years by a social enterprise called Who Made Your Pants? Becky John set up this social enterprise in order to make beautiful, comfortable pants, but also to enable refugee women to find work. The women who work with Who Made Your Pants, they're learning English, they're learning a skill, and they're creating something useful and ethical, as the pants are made from end-of-line fabric that would otherwise be discarded by the clothing industry. So by doing this, Becky stimulates debate about why we're buying clothing made by low-paid women halfway across the world, but she's also at the same time creating that alternative, that space where something else can happen, a business founded on women's empowerment rather than aiming for profit at women's expense. And in our own small way at Women for Refugee Women, alongside our more sort of straightforward and goal-oriented media or political work, we try to carve out spaces that lend themselves to less predictable outcomes with activities like poetry or photography or performance where people can come together and women find new creative ways to connect. So to give just one example, one, one activity that inspired a lot of the women we work with is a project called Knitted Together, which is an initiative that was started actually by our local Women's Institute who came together with the refugee women's group we support in knitting sessions. And gradually they created this huge quilt that has become a symbol of solidarity with um, women in Yarlswood. It has over 400 squares. The idea is each of them is symbolic of a bed space in Yarlswood. And all over it's stitched with messages um, from members of the public, messages of solidarity and love for women in detention. I have to say, if I'm being completely honest, the creation of this quilt often irritated me and puzzled me as well as intrigued me. For a long time, you know, during its creation, I found it too sort of shapeless and chaotic while we had so much else to get on with. But over time, I saw how it's more 
sort of vivid and memorable than a lot of the other things we've done. And it, somehow it can go to places and often touch people where our clearer, more predictable messages can't. So it travelled to the summit to end sexual violence at conflict and Angelina Jolie stopped and chatted to the women making it and wrote her own message for it. And it went into Yarlswood last Easter because the pastor um, in the church, there, you know, allowed us to bring it in and talk to the women there about, you know, how we were thinking of them and how it had been made in solidarity with them. If you're interested, you can catch it this weekend at the Women of the World Festival in London, in the Royal Festival Hall. I mean, I, I don't want to make any sort of huge claims for that craft project, although I do now, having found it so shapeless and irritating, find it really beautiful and inspiring. And I suppose when I look at it, I can see that it symbolises this idea of trust and working together and trying to find new ways to connect and carving out new spaces. And I often think of one of the women who was involved in making it, a woman called Jade, who's another woman who truly inspires me. Jade's a survivor of torture and sexualized violence and conflict in Uganda. She saw her husband beheaded. Her children were disappeared. And she came to this country. And despite all she passed through, she is determined to work with other women, to try to protect women for what she went through, to ensure their voices are heard, to ensure that we in the UK are enabled to understand what women are going through. And when I think about Jade, I realise that feminism will only be truly just, truly, truly fair and truly feminist if the voices of women such as hers are heard as clearly as mine or yours. If we pursue that ideal that each woman in the world should have a voice and should have their rights, that involves working for reform, yes, to embed changes today, but it also involves believing in something beyond reform. I think it involves the realisation that borders and classes cannot continue to exist in their current form if those borders and classes mean that some are condemned to live without opportunity and without protection. Many voices are now being raised against our pitiless system of inequality both within the UK and globally, in which many lives are wasted, while others are protected and privileged. And even if we are the privileged, I feel we should listen to these voices and to the girls and women who are not protected. We have to support them in their struggles for their rights and let the outside in. And so I believe that as we go on, day by day, seeking our incremental reforms, step by step, we don't have to lose sight of that mountain that's still ahead of us. And at its summit, I believe, is not reform, but revolution. <laughs>